Okay, so we're carrying on in our beautiful Bible study, Midweek Boot Club, the Song of Solomon, the Song of Songs. And we're in chapter six, and last time we finished off with verse four. So quick, very quick recap, obviously, but we have come into this chapter five, and we've come into this virgin Shulamite that's in bed, making all the excuses not to get out of bed, eventually gets out of bed, enters into this time of tribulation, great tribulation maybe, where she is persecuted. You know, she came across the watchman and they stripped her and beat her, etc. And she was seeking the beloved and the beloved could not be found. And then she came across the forces of Jerusalem who inquired of her why her beloved was so special. And she gave for those three weeks worth of description of the beloved. And then he wanted to know where the beloved was so that they too could see. That's where we were last week with this daughter of Jerusalem. They also want to see the beloved. And in response to that, the beloved started to speak again last week in verse 4. Oh, my love, you are as beautiful as tears that we went into all this thing with the actual person, the, the, the character, the female character from Numbers. Lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as the army with banners. And that's where we'll finish off again tonight because this phrase, awesome as an army with banners, is repeated hopefully at the end of tonight's passage. So tonight we're looking at verse five onwards. Turn your eyes away from me, for they have overcome me. Not to be said about that without probably saying too much. But anyway, your hair, this is familiar, it's like a flock of goats going down from Gilead. So we'll repeat a few things by way of reminder. Obviously, the door's always open for more importance to this. But let's go through it. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep, which have come up from the washing. Every one bears twins, and none is barren among them. Like a piece of pomegranate are uh, your temples behind your veins. So this will be revision. Well, we've seen this before. I like some of the commentators, though, that they, they you know, make the obvious comment that this is a repeat, but also saying pretty much the same things we're saying is that even though she's fell away in some way and being asleep and not responsive to his requests to come, he still loves her and he still sees her through these eyes of completion, if you like. And like a little bit like the, you were just saying then uh, from the Torah portion, when Bilam just prophesies, oh, how lovely are your tents or your... Uh, Oh, how, how lovely are your tents, O oh, Jacob, your dwelling places, your, your tabernacles, O oh, Israel. That way that God sees. And despite her uh, falling away or her uh, backsliding or lukewarmness in her life, she's back in the right place. And now he says the same things, very similar, if not identical, things that we've already seen said of the first Shulamite, if you can accept that way of looking at it. Okay, uh, this, I've had no real help from the commentators reading this passage. It's, it intrigues me, it always has done, but I've got not much more help on this passage. There are 60 queens and 80 concubines. You know, the numbers in Sweden, but there's not much I've got and not much the commentators have got. And virgins without number. My dove, is that dove passage again. My dove, my perfect one is the only one, the only one of her mother, the favourite of the one who bore her. The daughters saw her and called her blessed, which they have, you know, the daughters of Jerusalem have said, fairest amongst women, you know, they have acknowledged her in this way. The queens and the concubines, and they praised her, saying, according to most commentators, it's still them speaking, who is she? who looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun. And that's where we'll finish tonight again. Awesome as an army with banners. You know, what a, what a passage. And I've never really, I've always loved that past that verse. I've always loved it in the simplest sense of reading it. 
And when I've seen in nature, I love it when the sun's out and the moon's out. And whenever I see that on them days, I always think of this, just the glory of both of them witnesses in the sky being out together. That just reminds me of that. But I would have had nothing else to say about it until this week when I've read it in Hebrew and really seen the words that are used, the vocabulary. It's not what you'd expect. It's not the normal moon and the normal sun. It's so much more to it, which I delighted in because it is consistent with the way I'm trying to present this song through the eschatological lens, if you like, the end time lens. And that last verse there really harmonises and supports the backdrop of all this, that it's the last days, it's the coming of the Messiah, it's the days of tribulation and Jacob's trouble and all of them things make sense with that passage. So that's where we'll finish tonight. But we'll go back over what we just read now. As I say, not in so much detail because we have already covered this, a lot of this in chapter four. But let's go over it again. Obviously, feel free anytime you feel led to uh, intervene. Praise the Lord. Thanks for this, Lord. Teach us and show us. This first verse, well, first five, first verse five, where we start tonight. As I said, there's a lot to be said about this, but I'm not going to spend a great deal of time in it. The reason I say there's a lot to be said is because the commentators, especially Gil, who summarises all of the commentators by going through the various interpretations of this. Because even in Hebrew, it's like, it's, you know, he does use obscure language, so it's some, especially later on, I'm really grateful for. But this one is sort of, some have said that it's, Maybe the obvious, I'll turn your eyes away from me. Oh, it's too much for me. You're overwhelming with your eyes, you know, dove eyes, as we've seen. And that's good. Um, yeah, I can see how that could be easily the, the case. That they have overcome me. They have won my heart. You know, which again, Gil says, this is just the grace of our Lord that he allows himself, as it were, to be won over by the faith and the love of his people, you know. But others, rightly as well, say in other ways, another one says, uh, they have made me proud, not in the wrong sense of the word proud, but in the, the way Yeshua would uh, be amazed wow. at faith. Yeah. You know, sometimes like that, that blows me away that when he is, he is, what's the word he uses, but what, overwhelmed by faith. He's astonished, he's amazed, he marvels at their faith. That language that he is may overwhelmed with amazement at the faith of his people, you know, which is just a great thing, isn't it? Um, and this one, though, some render it, turn your about your eyes over against me, turn your eyes, look upon me. Some people translate this as saying, this being the first time of meeting after her ungrateful treatment of him, <laughs> you know, after all of that, get away and be asleep and taking time to open up to him, he's not there. And Gil, this is again saying, this is the first coming together since that time. And she might be filled with shame and confusion, and therefore hung down her head or looked on one side. Wherefore he encourages her to look him full in the face with a holy confidence. For such looks of faith are very agreeable to our Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just beautiful language, but there's more that I've got to several interpretations of just that verse, <laughs> but I don't want to get too bogged down and just leave that with you for now. That's okay, but just the whole you know, this embrace again, this coming together again, this relationship rekindled again, turn your eyes away from me or upon me, for they have overcome. And then what we've already seen, things we've already looked at, your hair, here we go again, your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Gilead. I don't know what stood out to me in that last time, was just the geographical reference, couldn't escape what that was all about, Gilead. 
is a, is a very famous covenantal place, isn't it? Gilead means a keep of witness. And it's because it's the place when Jacob was coming home after Jacob had spent, spent 20 years or so in Laban's household, being deceived and, you know, working for his wives and for, for flocks and all the rest of it. When it was time for him to come home and he fled Laban and Laban pursued him and then they made a mount of witness, didn't he? And that amazing treaty of don't cross over for harm one to another. You know, it still stands good to this day if you believe the stories of the Yom Kippur War with Anne's yeah, appearances at this place to repel the Syrian forces, etc. But anyway, I was just saying at that time with this stop with the geographical reference of this, that it is like a coming home phrase, you know, as she is doing, but you know, here, like a flock of goats coming down from Gilead, just like you'd see with Jacob coming home from that mountain range with all of his flocks that God had blessed them with in Laban's household, in spite of Laban, God blessed Jacob, didn't he? You know, so I brought that out last time. And then other things that I just said about goats uh, is that they are a very biblical animal, obviously, of course. They're very biblical. They're used in the Yom Kippur or Yom HaKippur, even the Day of Atonement. Goats, they are the day there in sin offerings. The goat's hair, as is being referred to here, is a you know, temple or a tabernacle phase. You know, one of the covenants, for the outer covenants for the tabernacle, was made of goat's hair. And, you know, as you're talking about it, I remember all them verses, don't you? And it was all the wise hearted women whose hearts were stirred up, spun goat's hair. So there's all of that going on, isn't it? When you're saying your hair is like this flock of goats. There's, the tabernacle language in there, you know, the the covenant, the, the blood atonement of Yom Kippur, all of this language is just what goats remind me of, is what I'm trying to say. And I think the, the way I concluded that was also if you see goats as opposed to sheep in that scenario, of, I'll separate the goats from the sheep then, are these being brought into the kingdom, you know, out of another kingdom in to the kingdom of God, goats that are being brought in, you know, sinners being brought into the kingdom of God. That's how I look at it, you know. Uh, and then it does go into sheep right after that. I'm not saying that that's the reason, I'm just saying you know, what it was talking about, your hair's like goats, and now it moves to the teeth, your teeth. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep, or in Hebrew, uh, Rachel. You know, Rachel, as in Jacob's wife, or one of Jacob's wives, Rachel, Rachel, is the Hebrew word for the sheep, or you, you lamb, you know, a female sheep, a you, and that's what this is saying. Your teeth are like a flock of ewes, Rachel, Rachel, Rachel's, which have come up from the washing. Everyone bears twins, and none is barren among them. So, Let's just go over it bit by bit. Your teeth, again, teeth, we've mentioned this word. It's a great word. You know, we looked at it in the context of ivory a few weeks ago. It's the same word for obvious reasons. You can have things tusk, etc. ivory, the word shame. But I remember saying last time, shame comes from this other word, shanan, shanan. And we read it from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7. And I'm not going to read it again, but it, it was then in the context of Teaching, teaching, teeth to connect it to teaching, Shannon. And it was in the context of teach your children, teach your children all the things that God has commanded you. Make sure you teach them to your children. Teach, Shannon, connected with this word for teeth, to teach. Which makes sense, doesn't it? Because we know that, you know, you know teaching without meditation you know that's how we learn isn't it by meditating or chewing you know yeah we haven't got no teeth you're not going to chew very well are you? you know especially the meat of the word you know you need teeth to chew and digest the meat of the word to meditate to chew is a teeth sort of function right? we've got teeth to chew to meditate to digest the word of god and that's why 
she has got these teeth like a flock of sheep which have come up from the washing, you know, whole clean, isn't it? Language of being washed in the word, washed in the water of the word, your conscience cleansed, you know, and your heart cleansed and your evil conscience washed clean. And also the fruitfulness of this one is that she bears twins, or these sheep bear twins, and none is bad in amongst them. So that's obvious. But just to bring out the word again uh, for twins, which we might have looked at last time, probably did. But anyway, it's the word ta'am, and it's um, not that often you see it used, but we have seen it used in the tabernacle language once again. Ta'am, twins, or to be coupled together. Same word, and we've seen it in the tabernacle language when all of the, uh, all of the beams all of the beams that made up the structure of the tabernacle were all tatam, coupled together, coupled together. So you can see this, can't you? This, again, picture of the body and these sheep with her young and they are all coupled together. The old, she bears twins, people that are joined together. This sense of oneness, this body mentality, is what is being is being brought out here that she brings twins to um and not oh, sorry. Go on. it's just because I'm I'm losing train of thought. It's just when you were talking then on um the teeth, I think we, we underestimate it about how it was so important to teach the children to pass it down from generation to generation. And I only read the other day where you know, um, I think it's Jacob and he, and he says, it wasn't for the fear of the God of my father, you know, and that's what they did. The fathers passed down yeah. each generation, the Torah. And so they lived in that fear and obviously they had to keep it alive, the yeah. words. And this is why we have the Torah today because generation to generation to generation, it was passed down. Yes. You know, so it just... Just not to underestimate the power of of that. What you're saying about you know teach your children because it's that's why we've got Torah today because they passed it down. And as I said, Jacob said if it wasn't for the fear of my father, you know, um, then the God of my father. It was obviously he had the fear of God because of what his father had taught him. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. That's okay. Awesome. Yeah, that's right. That's the point, isn't it? That's what these teeth are being. They commend us for that they are good teeth. You know, and as we looked at it last time, I'm not going to go really looking at these scriptures, but we looked at it last time, see good teeth and bad teeth, you know, biblical bad teeth. And I'll just mention one, which from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 7. I will take away the blood from his mouth and the abominations from between his teeth. You know, we got that sense again, a little chewing on abominable things, terrible, you know, wrong teachings, mm. erroneous doctrines, bad teeth. Mm. <laughs> you know, we see gnashing your teeth only with that rebellion, rebellion to God's where people gnash the teeth. Mm. You know, so there's bad teeth in the Bible and these are good teeth, mm. teeth that teach, that chew, mm. that bring up twins, which are people that are coupled together you know, teaching the faith. Mm. You know, and that's what we're going to see in the last days. We're going to see converts being brought in, made into biblical disciples because they will be taught right mm. in these last days. Mm. Amongst all of the deception that silly dopes will get caught up in, you know. But anyway, so teeth, let's move on, I think. Anything else anyone wants to say on that? No, I'm bad at, um, not bereaved, not barren. I would just say that it means that the people that they're bringing into the kingdom stand, you know, and the, the trained right, you know, to be part of the end time body of Christ. So the next one, which again, I know a lot of us love these pomegranates, we do, you make a lot of them, don't we? We see them in the Torah, the pomegranates, and that's again saying it. Like a piece of pomegranate are your temples 
behind your veil or locks. You know, everyone sounds like that, but it's again this pomegranate. So we've said loads about it. I don't think that you want to bring out by way of reminder on that. But I just always say on this, the pomegranate is the fruit of seed, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Seeds, many, many seeds in a pomegranate. And the temples are what's being spoken of here. You know, I just always remind you of thought, doesn't it? What's going on with your thoughts? What's your thought life? What are you thinking about? You know, like Colossians says, if you have been raised with the Messiah, set your mind on things above where the Messiah is seated. You know, have we got pomegranate temples at our minds thinking about chewing over the seeds of the word of God? The word is the seed, isn't it? And so that's what I think of with pomegranates. And obviously with pomegranates, we also go right down don't we, to the hem of the high priest's robe. Every time we talk about pomegranates, our eyes have to go down don't we, to the hem of the high priest's robe where there were golden bells and pomegranates. Beautiful pomegranates, remember? Made of them holy temple colours of blue, purple and scarlet. Remember? The whole colour scheme of the tabernacle and the garments. Well, these pomegranates also are in that gospel colour scheme of blue, purple and scarlet. And so saying that alongside the thoughts, the seeds, meditating on the seeds, right next to every one of them pomegranates, there's a golden bell, golden bell. And I mentioned that at the time when we looked at it more deeply, but Golden Bell just speaks of the uh, footsteps of the Messiah. And that's what we're getting told here. Your pomegranate, your temples are like pieces of pomegranate. You're meditating, you're hearing the footsteps of the Messiah. You know he is coming, you listen for them. You know, we looked at it in light of the language from Exodus was very like the language from Genesis when Adam heard the footsteps of God in the garden, when he heard him walking in the garden and the high priest had these pomegranates and bells so that he would hear the high priest walking. And that's the picture of Yeshua. So our temples, our thoughts are meant to be on that, listening for his footsteps. You know, very Jewish phrase. We say the coming of the Lord. They say the footsteps of the Messiah. So pomegranate temples. Uh, pomegranates are just also, I just thought it'd be worth mentioning from Joel chapter 1, verse 12, and Haggai chapter 2, verse 19. You see there there's a connection between pomegranates and joy, everlasting joy. So this is what it's meant to be telling us that these thoughts, this is so joyful as well. Joyful that the Lord's come caught up with them thoughts. Mm. I think the way we should be. You know, I don't know if we can get too, I don't know if you can be too zealous for this. I'm zealous for the Lord's come. He's zealous to come. So anyway, moving on. Because this is like, oh, that was all things we've looked at before. So anything you want to say, then let's just move on. Because as I said, this one, I love this verse, but I've never, you know, never really got much out of it in terms of why it's telling us these numbers. And the commentators haven't helped in any great way. So it is what it is at the moment. But there are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. You know, 60 queens, 80 concubines and virgins without number, which always gets me excited. Any reference to without number. Because it takes us back, doesn't it, to the Abrahamic promise, the, the covenant with God that made with Abraham that he would have a seed and his seed would be innumerable. And we read it even again this week, didn't we, in the Torah? Who can count? You can count the dust of Jacob, you know, you can count one quarter of Israel. It's, it's, that is the promise, isn't it, to Abraham that he would have seeds without number innumerable like the sand on the seashore, like the stars in the heavens, and innumerable multitude of offspring by faith. 
mm. by promise, by faith. The covenants of promise is an innumerable multitude. So that makes me really rejoice when I see this, that these 60 queens, 80 concubines and virgins without number. And I like what one of them said, you know, there's three levels there, and I would see them eat these as levels, queens, concubines and virgins without number. The way uh, in First John chapter 2, there's three levels there, isn't it? That John writes to old men. Is it young men and youth, is it? First John chapter 2. Fathers, little children, fathers and young men, you know, the different levels there, three different tiers of people that John writes to. And I think that makes sense to me that there is sort of three tiers here. There's queens, concubines and virgins without number. You know, queens are legitimate wives. Concubines, I didn't know this, but apparently the secondary or half wives, but they will, their children receive no inheritance. Their the children of concubines didn't inherit, which I wasn't aware of. So I can't quite grasp what is being said by the numbers of it all. But I just focus on the last part, that there's virgins without number. And they mentioned many times, Psalm 45, as a sister or brother Psalm, whatever, to this. And Psalm 45, the virgins, and in Psalm 45, it says in verse, verse 9 of Psalm 45, King's daughters are among your honourable women. At your right hand stands the queen in gold from Ophir. Listen, O daughter, consider and incline your ear. Forget your own people also and your father's house, so the king will greatly desire your beauty. And then going on to verse 14, it says, uh, or verse 13, the royal daughter is all glorious within the palace. Her clothing is woven with gold. She shall be brought to the king in robes of many colors. The virgins, her companions who follow her, shall be brought to you with gladness and rejoicing. They shall be brought. They shall enter the king's palace. So that's a great picture, isn't it, of the, the chosen bride with all these virgins, companions as well. I just see this as the language of Yeshua when he's teaching in the same on the Mount that there will be great and there will be least in the kingdom. You know, it depends on faithfulness and obedience. He says, whoever does what I say and teaches others to do what I say will be great in the kingdom. And whoever doesn't will be least in the kingdom. You know. So will it have nothing to do with revelation? I was going to say that. Oh, right, yeah. Sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you know, those who come up the yes. tribulation. Amen. Then. Well, I was going to quote that one to finish off this, this section before we go to the next verse. But you're right to jump there. And Sorry, it is. No, it's, it's not it's brilliant that you make the connections like that because we should. This is the language we are behind in this language. You know, we repeat this over and over again because it's wonderful language. You know, it's Revelation 7. Is this, I would say to you, 60 queens, 80 concubines. You know, we know that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, you know. But in all of this, the next verse, we'll bring it all together, hopefully. But it's chapter Revelation 7, as you're saying, like verse 9. After these things, I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number. And that's what that's saying. There's virgins without number. And that's what this is saying. There's a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, people and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice. And this is glorious, you know, mm -hmm. saying salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honour and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. 
I mean, this is all going to happen soon. You know what? Reading some relevant piece of history or something, this is prophetic future. What's going to happen? And there's going to be people that cannot be numbered. How can it not be connected to this? Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, who are these arrayed in white linen, in white robes, and where do they come from? And I said to him, say, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and wash their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Wow. To 60 queens and 80 compromises and virgins without number. Praise the Lord, without number, it's all that language, it's all that Abrahamic that was confirmed with Isaac and with Jacob that the seed, the promised seed, will be immutable. Praise the Lord, you can see in Revelation 7, it comes to pass, you know. Praise God. And this space now, as I say, I love this, my, my dove. So, where's the dove once again? The dove, you know, you mentioned before from Hosea, Shemin, Hosea 7, the, the silly dove or the deceived dove. So be careful, doves. <laughs> be careful in these days that we're in now of great deception. You know, doves can be deceived. They have got monogamy. They have got straightforward looking eyes. You know, this is all the attributes that we've looked at with the dove. But Hosea 7, Talking about Ephraim amongst the nations being a silly talk is a word of caution mm -hmm. as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. To all the doves. But my dove, my perfect one, is the only one. Now I say when I you know really relate to this sort of song because I know when I'd be in a silly dove and I'd gone playing out in the world again, fell back in love with the world and all of the Tysons of the world, you know, and fell out of love with the church. Didn't fall out of love with the Lord, and I fell out of love with church, and fell out of love with fellowship, and fell out of love with Christians at that stage in my life. I went back to the world, and you know, horrible, etc. But when I came back to the faith, when I came back into a meaningful relationship, this face broke my heart because it really was like the Lord restoring my soul, saying, my dove, my perfect one, is the only one, the only one of her mother, the favourite of the one who bore her. The daughters saw her and called her blessed, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. And I just really got a sense of, you know, the Lord loves everyone, the Lord loves the whole world, but I got a sense of this, that he loved me. And this was how the language started to go, wow, wow, Lord. In the midst of all, all the, the people you love and care for, I can hear you speaking to me in this. That there's virgins all over the place, but he has got the capacity. Don't, don't be jealous of this, because he means it to you and you and everyone that's got ears to hear this. He's got an ability, although he loves everyone. Like when he got children, you know, you got my favourite children. You love them all, don't you? But you got the ability to love each one like the one. You know, that's the, like, like they're the only one. You know, not to the detriment of anyone else, but you've got the capacity as a parent to pour your love in to that child mm. as if it's the only one you've got. Mm. And that's what this is saying. You know, there's millions, it's innumerable, but it doesn't diminish and dilute mm. my 100% love and attention for the you. Mm. You know, like I like to say a lot in Paul, I love the way Paul's got the boldness in Galatians. You know, he brought the gospel to you know, where even Paul, you know, thank God for Paul. He understood God loved the whole world and loved everyone. But he said, didn't he, in Galatians 2, that my old man was crucified with Messiah. And that's how personal it is. He's saying, not like your old man, although that's true, but he's saying, my old man was crucified with Messiah. And the if I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And that is a level I, I want to aspire to get to, where I absolutely know he done it for me. And that verse really opened this up. 
you know, 10 years ago, broke my heart. Went, wow, Lord, you can still love me. You know, you can still love me. Uh, it just broke me and communicated to me his ability to love in this intense way. I love everyone else, but it doesn't take away. There's no competitiveness in it all. But it, this verse, I think, has got the ability to really get through to the hearer and really go, wow, you love me. Because as I say, it's not a oneness to the exclusion of anyone else. It's the ultimate oneness that the gospel's about. You know, the one new man language, the John 17 famous prayer, isn't it? I pray that they will be Echad is the word. Echad, that they will be Echad. They be one as you and I are one, Father. I pray that they be one. And that's the oneness here that he's seeing. You know, we can see this now in the context of millions of people. Everyone is one part of this one. But I just think, here if you know that he's saying it to you, you're the only one. You know, I could have anyone in the world but it's you. That's the beauty of this. Yeah. The only one. I had its same language as Psalm 133, isn't it? How good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity, in that oneness, you know, that's what he's seeing here. The ability to be one, <laughs> you know, the ability to be one with one another, you know, without no uh, barriers, without any obstacles to this, the ability to hold each other's hand in that temple, that tabernacle language, that language of unity, being coupled together. So I think it all works. You know, the oneness of the body, but the ability to really heal and for yourself. I know, like Paul, he died for me. He gave himself for me and the whole world. But I know, if I know it for me, it'll, it'll help me to communicate it to the world with more sincerity, with more conviction that Jesus loves you, mate, and Jesus loves you, love. And, but where they'll go, he does. <laughs> you know, I want that. I want that tool. I want that sword in my arm to be able to pierce that part of people with the love of God and communicate, God loves you. You know, I've got a banner saying, God so loved the world, gave his only begotten son, and I want to be able to communicate that to individuals God so loves you mate on the streets or whatever and they go I believe I believe he loves me you know so that's how what I get out of it anyway. you know it's the way God spoke to the father spoke to the son isn't it you are my son my only begotten son you know it's like well we are in that one so that's enough of that. The only one of a mother, every time we talk about mother, we know we're locking up, don't we? We know we're locking up because whenever we speak about our mothers here, we're thinking about that mother, oh, okay. the heavenly Jerusalem, yeah, the heavenly Jerusalem, the mother of us all, you know, daughters of Zion. The favourite of the one who bore her, well, favourite is actually chosen, chosen, and that word's come up again in a minute. Um, but the favourites of the one who bought here, that'll come up again in a minute. Right? Anyone want to say anything on this? Not anything oh. So I think I'm covering what I've got written down here anyway, so moving on. More their favourites. The daughters, so this will be again, the daughters of Jerusalem, which we have already seen them say these things, or oh, fairest amongst women, etc. The daughters saw her and called her blessed or happy Asher, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. And then in the New King James that I read from, it, it's, uh, it carries on as if this is all part of the beloved speech. So the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. Who is she 
he looks for as the morning. But virtually all the commentators don't agree with that, and they say that this is the end of what the beloved saying, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her, and in brackets or in italics, saying, so they suggest that this is the beloved handing over to the queens and the concubines, and that this is them saying what they're about to say. The new King James carries on with this as part of the beloved speech. I don't think it makes any difference to what gets said. But just to put that thought in your heads, because I've never cared to me, but all the commentators pretty much agree that this is our hand and over of the Madison to these uh, queens and concubines and daughters that saw her, call her blessed, and they say what we're about to read now. Now, I got to the point that I wanted to get to to spend the rest of the time in this verse, to be honest with you, because this verse is amazing. So we're going to look at it in some detail. So make sure I've just finished off that passage. Got lots of notes here from the commentators, but I think I've pretty much said what they're saying. Yeah. So whoever's saying this, the beloved or the queens and the concubines, whoever's saying it, let's look at what they're saying. Who is she who looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, awesome. Weird banners, we said that last time, it's in italics and as an army, but the context is still right. It's, you know, it's got that military conquest language to it, but it doesn't say as an army. So who is she who looks forth as the morning? I mean, the, the pulpit commentary, the pulpit commentary, says this, perhaps no sentence in the Old Testament has been more frequently on the lips of devout men, especially when they have been speaking of the victories of the truth and the glowing prospects of the Saviour's kingdom. It's like, wow, I haven't heard it <laughs> in all my time going to churches, etc. I've never heard this verse mentioned, never mind, expounded upon and taught. But according to the pulpit commentary, <laughs> it's the most frequently used Old Testament sentence. You can see what it must have been like in the days, back in the day, you know what I mean, when there was great moves of God in this country and great men and women of God had been raised up. And let it be that way again for us, you know, for us small little group. Let us embrace this language because this is speaking of what we all ought to be. <laughs> you know, as I said, whatever's said of this side of chapter five, I take it that it would have applied to the previous Shulamite, that she also looked forth as the morn, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, awesome with banners. You know, this is what Yeshua wants his people there, like, you know, he wants his people like this. He is commending her for this, or the, the, the chorus has joined in with him and praising the beauty of the Shulamite. But let's break it down. Who is this? Who is this? We've seen that already in the song in various ways. We'll see it again in chapter 3, verse 6. It was, who is this coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke? And I, at that time, and I think I would stick with that, that that was a message of Yeshua himself coming. Who is this? You know, Solomon in the Song of Songs. And then you see it again next time, or in a couple of times from now, in chapter 8, verse 5. Who is this? Who is this? Coming up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved. You know, so it's that refrain again in the songs. Who is this? Who is this? We've seen it before, but it just reminded me of Yeshua in Matthew 8. Remember when uh, they were on the boat and Yeshua calmed the storm? And that's what the disciples said, wasn't it? Who is this? Who is this man <laughs> that can do these things? So it's right that, that his, his followers, his beloved people, those that follow him, I like him in that way. And have that striking effect of, who is this? You know, who is this? Who looks forth as the morning. And this is when, what I said at the start, 
So we're finishing off. Not sure how long it's going to take, but this is what we we're finishing tonight with this verse. Still got a few pages to go through of intense notes now. These, you know, we've got together for anything tonight. It's for this, but because it's consistent with what I'm presenting this as, amongst all the other ways that people can look at this song, I see it very much through the end time lens, as you know. And this language now is consistent with that. So let me try and explain it with the, with he, with the vocabulary of this. You know, the commentators maybe have said some good things on this, but it was the real Hebrew language. And just the, the simple, I'm sure yours are written out, Teddy, with the Blue Letter Bible, just simply looking at that, what the words say. And as soon as I started to see the sun and the moon, and they're not the sun and the moon in the usual language, it's like, what's going on? And it's worth the verse by verse Bible study that this takes you on to set the scene for what's going on. It's very apocalyptic, very apocalyptic, because the very first thing, who is she who looks forth? Who is she who looks forth? You know, you all know that Yeshua said that the days of his coming will be like what? The days of Noah and the days of Lot, or Lot, is it really, but Lot, you know, Lot. He said this coming will be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot, you know. And this is the first time that this word is used to look. It's, again, it's not like a, the usual Hebrew word. It's these special usages of the words put you on the path, the, the dot to dot picture that it's going to paint for us anyway. But the first usage of this to look is Shaka, and it's in Genesis 18. You're looking at this woman who looks forth as the morning, and this looking forth is what was used in Genesis 18, verse 6. So Abraham hurries into the tent to Sarah. Oh, this, I don't know if I've got that right. Genesis 18, verse 6. Then the men rose and looked forward, stopping the way down. Is that right, is it? Genesis 18, 16. 16, sorry, I put 6. Let me just change that. 18, thanks, Teddy. It's Genesis 18, verse 16. And the, the language is, the men rose from there and looked toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them. So this is the first time it's used this looking toward. And it, the sense of it is, for the impending judgments that's going to take place on Sodom and Gomorrah. Who is she who looks forth as the morning? So stays away when I'm leaving, I'm going. Wow, it's like the days of Lot. Sodom and Gomorrah is about again. And the, 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 the language Solomon's using is pointless back into that narrative of the angels look towards Sodom. And then you see it again in the same passage in chapter 19, verse 18. Then Lot said to them, please know my lords, indeed now your servant has found favour in your sight and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. Where is it? Lochay is a little village, that. No, yeah, but I, I might put the wrong reference down again, but none, none of this. This was 1928. 28, what's happening there? Thanks, Terry. Verse 28. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the lands of the plain, and he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land, which went up like the smoke of a furnace. So there it is again in that Sodom and Gomorrah language, this obscure word, shakaf, to look toward. So that's 19 verse 28. But the main usage of this word, you see it with people looking out of windows, as in like King David's wife, and she looked out the window. You see it used of looking out the windows, but you see it mainly used of the Lord in the looking down from heaven, looking down from heaven. Or in Exodus 14, you see it, Exodus 14, you know, we love that. 
Song of Moses. Well, this is the lead up to the Song of Moses, Exodus 14, verse 24. And it says that it came to pass in the morning, watch that Yahubah look down, Shachaf, look down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and clouds. So this is that real divine looking. He looked down. You see it in Psalm 14, verse 2. Just to finish this quick one. Psalm 14, verse 2. Yehovah looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who want to stand, who seek God, you know. So in the same way that God is looking down from heaven, she is looking forth as the morning, you know, these eyes will meet. God's looking for people who are looking. His eyes are roaming, looking to anyone who understands. Is there anyone who seeks God? His eyes are looking down from heaven, looking for eyes like this Shulamite, you know, with the dove's eyes. But that they're looking in this way as well, and looking to heaven. And also looking at what's going on in the world and understanding, wow, these are the days of Lot. Mm. Their world is in a state just like it was in the days of Lot, mm. just like the Lord said it would be. You know, I was in town yesterday preaching a great city, St. George's Hall. You know, we had a Ukraine flag the last few what, couple of months flying above it, you know, which if you're on Ukraine frenzy, then that's admirable. But they changed it now to the rainbow flag. You know, they were supporting a, a nation that was being oppressed. Now I don't know what nation, you know, but they're flying the rainbow flag over our gorgeous city, St. George's Hall, which just gives me the opportunity to tell the people of Liverpool, these are the days of Noah. Mm -hmm. You know, the rainbow's got nothing to do with any other organization like the NHS or any other organisation. It's to do with God's covenant, isn't it? So I look at the rainbow flying and tell people, these are the days of Noah. These are the days of what? These are the days, Yeshua said, will be at the time of his coming. So who is she that looks forth as the morning? That's what I get out of it, <laughs> which I never used to. But the Hebrew has took me into that language. You know, there's a few more verses, but I won't go there. Because here's the next one. She looks forth as the morning but again it's not your normal way for morning you know like when you when we get up everybody you say to me don't you focus off <laughs> <laughs> good morning okay morning it's like it's not that language it's this word shaka which is a great word shaka it's also in the narrative we've just been looking at from genesis 19. that's all we've got this reference right there is 15. When the morning dawned, yeah, so it's in that narrative again of Lot, Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah, and when the morning dawned, you know, you might think, oh, yeah, but it's just not the usual everyday language for morning. It's this dawning language. While the, when the morning dawned, but I think, you know, if you've studied for us for any amount of time, you'll know how much we love this next verse in Genesis 32. Because here's where it comes up again, this word for morning. And that's what we're looking at. Who is she who looks forth as the morning, as the shakha? This is where it should take us to Genesis 32. Remember this, don't you? Verse 24. Genesis 32. Verse 24, then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day, the shatter, the morning. Who is this who looks forth as the morning? Who is this? It reminds me of Jacob. That's what she reminds me of. She reminds me of Jacob who wrestled with the man or the Angel of the Lord, or as Jacob himself says, I saw God face to face. You know, 
I agree with the theologians who say that this is a Christophany, you know, a pre-incarnate appearance of Yeshua. That's who this is, that Jacob's wrestling with. And that's what Yeshua is looking for, isn't it? People like this that will say, you know, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the sockets of his hip and the sockets of Jacob's hip was out of joints as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. That's what Yeshua was looking for. I love what Jackie said months ago with this connection with this portion, but it was that, the same on the mounts, blessed are and blessed is, and blessed is the one. You gotta sometimes wrestle for this. And I, I want that blessing. I wanna be me. You said blessings that are meek, Lord. I wanna be me. Make me this way, Lord. You know, wrestling in faith to take hold of, lay hold of what we can have spiritually. But sometimes it's gonna take this. Are you willing to wrestle at the morning? In relation to what you were saying to before, have you seen the first reference to that word yet? Yeah. Go on. Lot. When morning dawned, yeah. the angels urged Lot. Genesis 19, verse 15. Yeah, yeah I just said that. I'm sorry. Yeah, no sound brilliant, Terry, because that's what I know you're doing there. I don't know if you'll get things out of it. And also, um, Brilliant. blessing, it was when um, Esau looked for the blessing and it was too late, you know. It's wrestling for that blessing, isn't yes. it? Yes. You know what I mean? That inheritance again. That's what I'm saying. Mm. That's where this language takes you to. You know, this dawning, morning, who is she? Mm. She reminds me of this one mm. that wrestles, mm. that she's got that Jacob spirit. Of I want the blessing, mm. and if you want the blessing, I believe God's able to get us to the place like He did with Jacob, the Ford Yabok, and He changed His name there to him from Jacob to Israel, and that's what's going on here. Who is this that looks forth and you no know, reminds me of the wrestle I had with Jacob? Mm. It's the language that's used, and you know, uh, just to carry on with that passage. I mean. I'm probably not going to carry on in that passage, but whenever we do do it in the Torah, I always make the connection with John 21, when Mary comes, when it's dark, when it's dark, and then later on the other women come, when the sun has risen. And you see the language in that passage in Genesis 32, when the, it's the stage about to break, and then... After this wrestle, it says that the sun has risen. And it's irresistible to me that it's drawn us into that scene of the garden tomb when the tomb is empty. And when at that time, before the sun has risen, clearly Mary gets there when it's dark. The other women come when the sun has risen. And in that between time is when Mary grabs hold of Yeshua and Yeshua says exactly what he said to Jacob. Let me go. Because I've got to ascend. That's what he says in John, isn't he? Don't cling to me, for I must ascend. So my father and your father, my God and your God. You know, that is, that narrative of Genesis 32 takes me to the gospel narrative of the resurrected Yeshua saying, don't cling to me. Just the way he's saying with Jacob, let me go for the day breaks. It's at the exact same time that Yeshua is appearing to me in this, while it's dark, before the sun has risen, and this urgency to let me go is that for me. I mean, I just can't resist, but that's what I see in it. And there's so much more in this. I'll just mention maybe one more from the biblical narrative and this simple way of studying the words, just follow the words. And the next word study of this is, Gen is Joshua 6, you see, verse 15. This is what this Shulamite is reminding the beloved of, all of these components. Just make up the picture. She's one who wrestles with him, wants the blessing. She's a morning person. And then it says in Joshua 6, 
verse 15, it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the shakha, the dawning of the day, and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. You know, talk about as awesome as an army with banners. Talk about this victorious assembly that the Lord's seeing here. Here is she who looks forth as the morning, but as the dawning. It's, these are the times this word's used amongst several others, several others which don't know if I'm going to go to unless there's anything you see and that you want to bring out. Because I've got great references here like Hosea chapter 6, verse 3, and Joel chapter 2, verse 2. Well, that's an interesting one, Joel, because as soon as I say that, I know it's the passage when it's obviously describing some other kind of army, not a righteous army, but it gives you the picture of an army in Joel chapter 2, verse 2, where it says, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains, the morning a people come great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. And this is obviously this terrifying Chaldean army that God raised up in judgment against his unfaithful nation. But you get the picture again of this fearful terrifying army has got this same language of who is she who looks forth as the morning and then finally on that word shaka shaka and this is hopefully and i really pray this today and pray it now for not just me but for you and pray and i know there's people here that have had this Early morning seeking. I know we all have, just the people I'm sitting with now when we used to meet together and get up early to pray together. And it helped, didn't it, sometimes to get together with people. And I'm praying that today, but I'm all I pray that we won't just read this tonight, but that it'll have the effect on us to make us this people. You know, if you've never been that person, that it will make you that person. Or if you need a revival in this lifestyle that it will have that effect on you because you want to be this person don't you you want the lord to say this about you don't you who's she who's this that looks for as the morning because the roots of this morning shaka is to seek early or diligently or earnestly and i thought i like that i said earnestly because it just i want to be an early earnest I want to be an early earnest. No, I'm not, Lynn's laughing at me, going, yeah. Well, not it's impossible with God. <laughs> you know, she likes saying a laughing. What are you laughing at? I didn't laugh. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, know what I'm saying? For me, it's tough. I'm making arrangements with people. Let's get up. Let's meet. Let's have early morning prayer. And it can affect your whole day, can it? You know, you can get up and pray together. You know, ideally, do it on your own. You sure it is. He sure got up before anyone did me and went alone to be on his own. And I aspire to that again, to be able to, you know, off the first thing, and I don't mind saying it out loud, first thing is come down and put the telly on, see what the news is. Well, I want to, and I said that to the Lord today, Lord, it's gone now. That's going to be not the first thing I do now. It's like, I want to see you earnestly and early, whatever early is. You know, well, yeah, but you know, Lynn's been getting up early, and you don't mind me saying it, and it's just been a wonderful discipline that the Lord has brought into your life. You know what I mean? Because that's the root of this who is she that looks for as the morning comes from the word shaka to seek early and diligently. So it's worth just reading the scriptures, and that's what I propose to do for the rest of this tonight, just read a few scriptures to make sense of the vocabulary we're looking at. Psalm 63, verse 1. Oh God, you are my God. Shaka, I will seek you. Early, I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. Yet my flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. You know, beautiful, isn't it? Isn't it? You know, we all preached yesterday. 
and the scores and temperatures. And the obvious message was, is anyone thirsty? <laughs> anyone thirsty? This is what Yeshua said, if you're thirsty, come to me. You know, and got into the woman at the well and all kinds, which was quite beautiful, to be honest. Part of yesterday preaching the gospel in light of the thirsting, mm-hmm. thirsting for God. Mm-hmm. And created us that heart. And, you know, part of the blessing is blessed. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for mm-hmm. righteousness. You know, creator us, Lord, this thirst for you, mm-hmm. for your righteousness. And this hunger and thirst to early will I seek you early early will I seek you Psalm 78 I've only got a few to read on this passage verse 34 when he slew them they sought him and they returned and saw earnestly for God so yet again in this context of coming back to God they earnestly and early they returned and sought earnestly for God diligently earnestly that's what this is saying who is she who looks forth as the morning who is she that is earnestly seeking God and early early I've got another one from Proverbs Eight. I don't think I'd have put it in if it wasn't relevant, so I'm going to read it, but I've got a few and I won't read the whole. Proverbs 8 17. But again, it's just coming from this word study. Oh, yeah. I love this is wisdom. I love wisdom, loves those who love me and those who seek me, shaka, diligently, earnestly will find me. You know, I think enough said on that. Although I have got more scriptures, like I'll just say in case you watch them, you want to read them yourself. Isaiah 26, verse 9, Hosea chapter 5, verse 15. I put them in my notes, so they must be relevant. But I'm moving on now because I want to finish this off tonight, this passage. And there's still quite a bit to get through. So, uh, next part of it is. Who is she? It looks forth as the morning, and we covered that, haven't we now? Fear is the regular word we've looked at many times. Yaffe, spoken of Sarah, spoken of Rachel, spoken of Joseph. You know, in the masculine sense, like you said last time, there's no male and female in this. So, you know, fear, fear. But this is when it really started to get excited reading this. As the moon, and the normal word for moon is Yareach. I do want to mention the moon in its normal sense, Yareach, but this is not that weird. I was like, when I seen the word, I was like, wow, didn't expect that, because it's the word Labana, Labana, you could probably hear it, Laban, Laban, Labana, which means white, which makes sense, doesn't it? You know, the moon is, well, sometimes it's white. If you saw it last night, it was one of them blood red, yellowy, half moons last night and that's the normal word for it the yarea but what's getting said here is different it's fair as the libana and that is only used in the song of songs and in two other places isaiah chapter 24 and isaiah chapter 30 the only other time this word's used it's clearly used in the context of the sun and the moon, but it starts to make sense of why is it this way being used in this way when you read, let's do it, Isaiah 24. And that's what I was saying earlier about the consistency and the harmony of this being the apocalyptic narrative of the last days. Because that's what Isaiah is speaking to. Isaiah 24. I'm just going to read a couple of verses from Isaiah 24. First, verse 4. The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth languish. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws, changed 
the ordinance, broken, the everlasting covenant. Therefore, the curse has devoured the earth, and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. You know, there's no doubt <laughs> this is apocalyptic stuff, very, you know, Book of Revelation language. It says in verse 19, the earth is violently broken, the earth is split open, the earth is shaken exceedingly, the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall totter like a hut, its transgression shall be heavy upon it and it will fall and not rise again. No, it's very heavy, judgmental language, isn't it? About the devastating things to come upon the earth. And then it says, in verse 23, then the moon, not the usual moon, this moon, the Lebanon, will be disgraced and the sun ashamed. For Yehovah Sabaoth will reign on Mount Zion and, and in Jerusalem and before his elders gloriously. So, you know, that language, don't you? The moon will be disgraced, the sun ashamed. You know, it's like what we see in Joel and what Yeshua says in Matthew 24. And what you see in Revelation 6, that the sun is turned to sackcloth, the moon is turned to blood. These lights that the Lord God made and put them in the sky, didn't he, to be signs. It says in Genesis 1, 14, let them be for signs. You know, we see it in Revelation 12, don't we? The sun and the moon come in and start to really speak to the end days, don't you? When the woman is clothed with the sun, and the moon and her feet, and these celestial bodies that the Lord God Almighty made the day for these reasons to be signs. So, you know, I think people made a lot of the blood moons and this, that, the other, and you know, they're not as infrequent as they are made out to be. They happen quite a lot, don't they? But they are signs. But, you know, the end time ones aren't going to be just the usual, like last night, the blood's got a bit. Bit of a tinge of yellow sign, you know, they're going to be devastating signs. The sun darkened, the moon turns to blood, these things. And, and I'm just bringing that out because that is the word for moon. The word translated uh, used in Song of Songs, moon is Lebanon, and it's connected with the passage from Isaiah 24 which is devastating, but also more optimistically, the, where, uh, the passage from Isaiah 30, the final and only three, one of the only three times this word's used, Lebanon for moon, uh, is Isaiah 30, verse 26. And then it says in this brilliant yeah. passage, moreover, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold, as the light of seven days, in the day that Yehovah binds up the blues of his people and heals the stroke of their moon. So that word for the moon connects you with all of that. What's going to happen? The devastating judgments, but also the beautiful restoration that is going to take place for God's people in the last days. So that's the word for moon, and it's important to just say that it's Lebanon, which comes from the word Laban, which we've already said, which means to make white, which we have seen so many times in our studies from the wonderful Psalm 51, isn't it? The wonderful Psalm 51, the real repentance psalm. The the forgiveness psalm, Psalm 51, verse 7, Page me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. And that's where that word is there again, Laban. So all of this is what's going on. Who is she that looks forth as the moon? Fair, that looks forth as the morning. Fair as the moon. So you can also see it in this wonderful gospel sense of Psalm 51, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, Come, let us reason together, though your sins be as scarlet, yet you shall be whiter than snow. So you can see it like that, can't you? 
the picture of she's fair as the moon is. It's the gospel message of she's righteous. She is cleansed from all unrighteousness. She is washed from the scarlet stain of sin and through the blood of the Lamb, washed whiter than snow. Who is she? Fair as the moon. But maybe to finish off that understanding, here's where it is also used. Daniel chapter 11. And that's why I'm reading it. It really harmonizes and really um, supports the end time narrative of all this. This word, Laban, Laban to me white, is in Daniel chapter 11, verse 35, where it says, And some of those of understanding shall fall, some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end. You know, she is this, she is that. I was here. Who else was here? But that's the purpose of God, that even those who understand them shall fall to refine them, to purify them, to make them white. You know, and that's what's going on with this one. She's fell away and come back and being restored and now being purged because it all leads to Daniel chapter 12, verse 10, when it says, many shall be purified, made white and refined. You see, this is the total Daniel narrative of what's going to happen in the end days and that there will be people who through this terrible time will be purified, will be refined, will be purged and will be made white. You know, who is this that looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon, fair as the moon? Mm -hmm. But I do want to take the opportunity just quickly to mention the moon in its normal context. You know, in the, just the general moon, the thing that you see in the sky. I love the moon. I mean, I really do love the moon. It's in Colossians, you know, in all chapter 2, verse 17, Paul says, don't let anyone judge you regarding feasts, Sabbaths, feast days, new moons. Don't let anyone judge you regarding new moons. This is what Paul's saying in the New Testament. And he says, because they are a shadow of things to come. So whether you understand that or not, the new moon, according to Paul, is a shadow of things to come. You know, and I think that we're talking about with Sabbaths and feasts and things to come is all talking about the kingdom of God. The Messiah and his kingdom is shadowed in some way by the moon. And so don't let anyone judge you regarding new moons. And the scripture I want to bring out is Psalm 89, which some of you moon lovers will love. Because it's a brilliant psalm. It's a mighty psalm. Psalm 89, verse 20. I have found my servant David. With my holy oil, I have messiahed him, anointed him. With whom my hands shall be established, also my arms shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague those who hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name his hall shall be exalted. Also, I will set his hand over the sea and his right hand over the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also, I will make him my firstborn. We're talking about David and the son of David. We're talking about the Messiah, and he is the firstborn, isn't he? He is the firstborn from the dead. He is the firstborn of many brethren. I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep with him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also 
I will make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break, nor also the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever, like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. Hallelujah. Who is she who looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon? That's what the moon speaks of. The moon is the faithful witness in the sky that the son of David will reign forever. I mean, I love the moon. I want to see the new moon. I want to see the full moon. I don't worship the moon. That's what the Torah says. Don't do. But I thank the Lord when I see it and go, thank you, Lord, for that faithful witness in the sky that testifies to me right now that the son of David will reign forever, that he will do it, that he will accomplish this, that nothing will stop this. Hallelujah. It connects me with that. Don't let anyone judge you regarding new moons. There's a shadow of things to come. The moon to me is a faithful witness that speaks of God's faithfulness and his ability to accomplish what he said he's going to do. It's only there because God lets it be there. It's a great sign in the sky. And so all of this language, who is she? Why is she being compared to this? <coughs> because she's a faithful witness. <laughs> she's like the moon. She's like a faithful witness. Like someone who talks of the kingdom. Who loves the kingdom. <coughs> and proclaims the kingdom and the coming of the kingdom. That's what I get out of it. Is that okay? <clears throat> so she is fair as the moon. And again, whatever we've said about the moon, we can apply to the sun from them passages from Isaiah, you know, same sort of understanding about these witnesses. But the next part is clear as the sun. So we're finishing off soon, you know, with this last bit now. Clear, clear as the sun. Again, the sun is not your normal sun. The normal sun is the Shemesh. Shemesh, like where Samson gets his name from. Shemesh. But this is not Shemesh. This is uh, Hama, Hama, which comes from Hamam, which means heat. Warm, which makes sense, doesn't it? No. <laughs> warm, Hamam, heat, warmth. And that's what this word is, Hama. But again, it's used only a couple of times, and it is in the two passages of what I mentioned, Isaiah 24, Isaiah 30. But it is usually translated as heat, and it's translated as heat in Psalm 19. Psalm 19, beautiful psalm. But there you've got both. You've got the both words in this. You've got Shemesh, which is the usual word for sun. But you've also got Hama, which is this word translated as heat. So Psalm 19, verse 4. In them, he has set a tabernacle for the Shemesh, for the sun, which is like a bridegroom. You know, the sun is like the bridegroom coming out of his chamber. And rejoices like a strong man to all its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end. And there is nothing hidden from its chama, its heat. And so this, this Shunammite now, this revived on fire, if you like, Shunammite, is also radiating this warmth, this heat, you know, this warm glow. She radiates like the moon itself just reflects, doesn't it? 
reflects the light of the sun. It has no inherent light. It just reflects the light of the sun itself. And now this is the actual sun, which just radiates its warmth and its heat. And that's what she's being compared to here. Clear as the sun. And clear is, uh, we've already seen that word earlier on, when it said that she is the favourite or the choice swan of her mother. It's, it, it's the word bar, which means choice, but it also comes from, or it does come from the word bara, which means to be purged. We already looked at it, so I won't go there again, but it's the word we looked at in Daniel 11, verse 35, Daniel 12, verse 10, when again it's saying that there will be people that will be purged and they will be purified and they will be made white in the backdrop of the great tribulation being described in Daniel chapter 11 and 12. There will be people then that are shining like lights, shining like the stars. They will be drawing people and bringing people into the kingdom and then people will be getting purified and purged and the language that we're looking at, clear as the sun, you know, radiating the fragrance of the Messiah. You know, that's why maybe we're praying, we're told to bless with, that is, face shine upon you so that you will shine also his light, reflecting, radiating his light and his warmth. That's what's being said here. Clear, pure, Page as the sun. And there's lots more to say, but I'm going to just finish now with what we've already looked at last time, so I won't say much about this, but awesome. Awesome with banners. And we looked at that in great detail, or well, some detail last time, didn't we, with the whole uh, language of Exodus 17, remember? And Yahovah Nissi, the Lord is our banner. <laughs> Moses made an altar and called it Yahovah Nissi, the Lord of our banner. So any banners in this arm are all his arm. They're all his our banner. The Lord's our banner. We read in the song earlier on, his banner over me is love. And that makes complete sense when you understand that God is love. You know, so awesome as an army with banners. Awesome with banners. Fair as the moon. Clear, purified as the sun, awesome with banners, all proclaiming the love of God, all radiating his glory, his light, his warmth, his heat, awesome with banners, declaring his love. Hallelujah. So that's what we want to meditate on, understand, be. Aspire to be, head towards, pray to, be transformed into this. Amen. And I think I'm just going to finish there without trying to look at any more of my notes. I think I probably captured most of what I've read. So, Amen. Father, just want to thank you once again for the time you've had, the study we've had. The effect of this, Lord, your word does not be turned void. So please let this word penetrate each and every one that hears this, Lord. Let it create the heart of the earnest and airy seeker, the diligent seeker, Lord. Help us, Lord, no matter where we're at right now, you're able and willing, Lord, to restore and to revive. And that's what we read about, I believe, Lord. Someone that had fell away or at least just got indulgent and just became sleepy, but got revived through tribulation, I believe, through persecution, but got revived and got greatly restored, Lord, and became a great witness and became faithful and wise again, and led many in the way of salvation. I believe that's what we're reading about here, Lord. I believe we're hearing 
the praises that you put upon the people that do these things. So we want to be this, Lord. We want to be this. We want to be this. Shine and look and forth as the morning. We want to stand in the times we're in. Fair as the, the moon. Faithful witnesses, Lord. And clear as the sun. Paged. Sprout spot and blemish. So that people will see you in us. And be drawn to you, Lord. In Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. So, Amen. we'll leave it there and then we'll resume next time, whenever that may be.